Oh, Jesus, we consider you and all of your goodness. Lord Jesus, we consider your goodness, that you would condescend to come into this world and give your life as an atoning sacrifice for all of those who would believe in you. We trust and we rely on that work that you accomplished in our place. Jesus, we know that that same goodness will attend to you and attend to us at your second coming. And I pray that as we look at this text tonight, that you would be honored, O oh Jesus. You would be exalted for the Messiah that you are. So I pray that you would come to us and you would attend to us. You would give us what we need to understand your word. You would accomplish everything that you intend with this word. And it would be for your glory, and we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, Smet has been taking us through the book of Daniel on our Sunday evening services for the last several months, and we've seen several different glimpses of Jesus. Uh, tonight we're going to look at a passage of Scripture that how it is that Jesus comes to actually establish that rule and that reign on this earth. So if you have your Bibles with you, would you turn with me to Revelation 19? We're going to be looking at verses 11 through 21 together, and this is the story of how Jesus comes to assert himself for his millennial reign on this earth. But first, we need some context before we parachute into chapter 19. John is writing this letter to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And his purpose in writing is to comfort them with the truth that Jesus is the Messiah and that he is coming and that he is going to reign. He will come and he will reign on this earth for 1,000 years. So he opens his letter by presenting Jesus as the head of the church and the protector of the church. And then he provides instructions and he provides comfort and he provides warning to these seven churches. And then he explains that Jesus alone is qualified to break the seven seals that are on the scroll that will inaugurate the events that bring to the end this current age that we are in today. And then John begins to subscribe describe the seven-year period of time that is known as the Great Tribulation. It is a period of three and a half years of false peace, followed by three and a half years of Jacob's trouble, a time in which the Antichrist will assert himself and bring about unspeakable atrocities against the Jews. And then John describes the wrath of God that is being poured out on this godless world. There are seven sealed judgments, and there are seven trumpet judgments and seven bowl judgments. And the outcome that God has decreed before the end of the world is becoming very clear. It's becoming clear that that is about to happen. And then Babylon comes to an end. The economic and the religious system that is in place, that is installed by the Antichrist, it is luxurious. It is sensual. It is sinful. It is immoral. It has had its day, and God has had enough and he is bringing it to its end. At this point, we have kings and rulers on the earth. We have ten of them that align themselves under the Antichrist. God's design for kings and rulers in this world from Romans 13 is that they are a minister of God to us for our good. These ten kings are absolutely unfaithful to that charge. They've abused the authority that God has entrusted to them, and they have used it to martyr and persecute those who have come to Christ during the tribulation. And again, God has had enough. So he is bringing his son. Our passage tonight is going to describe how Jesus brings that deceitful, wicked rule of the Antichrist to an end. And he supplants that rule with his own rule. And he does so with a very impressive display. The most impressive display, of course, that is ever going to be witnessed in human history. What we want to take away from our time together tonight is two things about Jesus. One is the person of Jesus, and the other is the power of Jesus. Jesus is going to assert himself as the one true king, the Messiah who always has been entitled to rule over this earth and who will bring it to pass. We need to remember that the first advent of Jesus was one in which he came as a lamb. He came to give his life as an atoning sacrifice at the cross to purchase those who would put their trust in him to accomplish for them what they could not accomplish for themselves. 
In his second advent, Jesus is coming not as the lamb, but he's coming as the lion. He's coming to defeat and dethrone all the rulers of this world and to establish himself in their place as the one true king. This is the great battle of Armageddon. It's the fulfillment of so many Old Testament prophecies that tell us that Jesus really is the coming king. He's the everlasting Messiah. And it's good for us to remember that all of human history has been waiting for this event. Starting at the beginning, Adam and Eve were waiting for this. When God spoke of Jesus to the servant and he said, he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Adam and Eve were waiting for that. David was waiting for this in Psalm 23 when he writes, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A house that is here, that is in Zion, the city of God in Jerusalem. The saints who will have been martyred in the tribulation, those seven years, they will also be waiting for this time. Revelation chapter 6, they cry out to Jesus. They cry out, and they cry out this way. How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on this earth? They are waiting. All of human history is waiting for this event. And Jesus doesn't disappoint. He doesn't disappoint at all. He comes decisively, and he comes to accomplish his victory. So tonight, we're going to be looking at three different aspects of this, and we're going to spend most of our time on the first one. Uh, but first, we're going to take a look at the king's arrival. What are the circumstances? What are all the attributes of his arrival? That's going to tell us a lot about Jesus, and it's going to give us great hope for today, and hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about that. Then we're going to look at how the king's victory is announced and then we're going to look at how his victory is accomplished. So let's read together. We're going to read verses 11 through 19, 11 through 21 of Revelation 19. John writes, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in mid-heaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and those who sit on them, and those in the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves, and small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized. And with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. So let's take a look at the king's arrival. We're going to look at 13 aspects of the king's arrival. We'll move through them pretty quickly, but they're important because they give us confidence, they give us comfort, they give us assurance as to the person of Jesus and these are all things that the second coming of Jesus will put on display. And the first of these is his sudden appearance. And we see that at the beginning of verse 11. John writes, and I saw heaven opened. So the first thing that John sees before he sees anything else is he sees an exit point for heaven. What is within heaven is about to come pouring forth. And this is the great egress of Jesus himself. He's coming forth. And this is not some slow, drawn-out process. There is a sense of immediacy to this. A day, an hour has been appointed for Jesus to descend upon the earth. 
Now, this is it. And all of those who are opposed to Jesus will have to contend with him now. Paul tells the church in Thessalonica about this. He tells them this in chapter 5 in the, the opening verses of that chapter. He describes the suddenness with which Jesus is going to come. Starting in verse 2, he writes to them, he says, For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly. Like labor pains among a woman with child, and they will not escape. So their destruction is going to come upon them suddenly. This tells us that Jesus' arrival will be sudden. There won't be any posturing. There won't be any positioning. There won't be any getting ready at all. The sudden arrival on Jesus on this earth will be the suddenness, the same suddenness of his victory. And we'll get to that near the end. So that's the suddenness of Jesus' arrival. He's coming quickly. He's coming abruptly. Then John talks about Jesus' purity. The second coming of Jesus, his purity will be on display. We see that again in verse 11. And John says, Behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. So John says, Behold. Behold is very important for us to understand and see and notice. John is drawing our attention to something, and what he's drawing our attention to is a horse. But the focus here really isn't on the horse. It's on the whiteness of the horse and the one who sits on it. Because the whiteness of this horse speaks to the purity and the righteousness and the integrity of the one who sits on it. Jesus is, as we know, he's unblemished by any sin. His sinless, perfect character is announced and it's declared by the horse that he's riding on. And he's called faithful. As he's riding on this horse, he's declared faithful. This is said of a person who is worthy of the trust of other people, and Jesus is worthy of the trust of other people. He's worthy of that trust because he's faithful to the tasks that the Father has given to him. And he's been proving this for a long time. He proved this throughout his earthly ministry. In John chapter 6, verse 32, Jesus says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, not my will, but the will of him who sent me. So Jesus didn't come in his first advent to do his will, his own will. He came to do the Father's will, and he was faithful to that. He went to a cross. We think about Luke 22, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, a time of great anguish and great agony for Jesus. His sweat is like drops of blood that are dripping. And he prays to the Father, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Jesus understood the magnitude of the Father's wrath, and he said, Father, remove this from me if you are willing to do this. But this is the important part. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Here we are again. Jesus was faithful to the task. He was faithful to go through the most horrible, horrible suffering so he could purchase the salvation of all of those who would trust in him. He was faithful in his first ministry, in his first advent, his first earthly coming, and his second one will be no different. He will be just as faithful to execute his father's will in his second coming as he was in his first. Listen to what Jesus promises his disciples in Matthew 19 about how faithful he will be. This is when the disciples are there. This is in Jesus' earthly ministry. And he writes and he says, Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Jesus is not exercising his own will here. He's not exercising his own will to take the world. He is saying the Son of Man will come and sit on his glorious throne. It is his Father's task for him to exercise this. Jesus is also called true. Things that are true are things that are in accord with reality. And what is in accord with reality here in this context is Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus alone is the one who has the position and he has the right to rule on this earth. Every other ruler, their authority was given to them. Jesus himself possesses the authority. That is what is true. We want to put that in contrast with the authority that is in place when Jesus is coming to the earth, the authority of the Antichrist. We see that in chapter 13 of Revelation. And the Antichrist is speaking arrogantly, and he's speaking blasphemies. 
verse 6 of chapter 13 says, He, the Antichrist, opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. So to blaspheme God is to insult God. You do that by declaring that which is true about God to be false, or that which is false of God to be true. The Antichrist speaks blasphemy against God's name, speaking falsehood against God's identity as the sovereign ruler over all things. And he also speaks to blasphemy against God's people, speaking falsehood about the identity of those saints in heaven. And all of this will be proven false in the very immediate future. So the Antichrist is full of falsehood, but Jesus, by contrast, is full of truth. You can count on his words. Everything that he speaks will indeed come to pass. So we also need to look at Jesus, and John tells us that his, his second coming will put on display his righteousness, and we see that at the end of verse 11. In righteousness, he judges and wages war. And the emphasis here is on the manner in which Jesus judges and wages war. The war that he is about to engage in is one which will bring great harm to all of those who are arrayed against him. And what John tells us is that Jesus will prove himself to be above reproach in the way that he handles the task that is in front of him. No claim will be made against him regarding the manner in which he accomplishes his victory. Nothing that Jesus will do will be unjust. Everything that he does to accomplish victory will be above reproach. Why is that important to us? Why is it important that we understand that um, Jesus here is righteous in this? Well, it gives us confidence that his rule will be righteous after he accomplishes the victory. If the one who wages war does so, if he wages war in, in righteousness, then he will carry out his rule that follows that war in righteousness as well. And that's encouraging to think when we think about the millennial reign of Jesus, we will know that as he rules for a thousand years in that time, every moment, every hour of that time, he will be ruling in righteousness. Everything will be right. And that is encouraging to us today. Then John describes at the beginning of chapter 12, Jesus' penetrating vision. His eyes are a flame of fire. We know that no impurities exist in the presence of intense heat. Intense heat removes any impurities. And what this does is it points to the purity of Jesus' eyesight. And because his eyes are a flame of fire, there is nothing to impede Jesus' ability to assess his foes. There's nothing to impede his ability to assess them. He's able to see with perfect clarity the nature of his opponents, the abilities of his opponents, the location of his opponents. Nothing about them is hidden from him. Nothing about their intentions, nothing about their plans is hidden from them. He knows everything. He knows everything about them. Every trick, every strategy, every plan, every scheme that they have ready, he knows it all already, and the reason why is because of his eyesight. His eyes are a flame of fire. But Jesus' pure eyesight has bearing beyond what he's able to see and discern. It also affects the function of his body. Listen to what Jesus himself says in Matthew chapter 6 about the relationship between the eye and the body. In verses 22 and 23, Jesus says, The eye is the lamp of the body, so then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. When the eye is clear, it makes the whole body full of light. The eye guides the rest of the members of Jesus' body to act in accordance with an eye that has no stain within it. In this way, John's readers have assurance that every single act of Jesus that he performs as he accomplishes his victory will be motivated by his pure and holy character. And then John talks about the exclusive rule that Jesus has. He says, Jesus has on his head many diadems. There are many diadems on his head. This is really helpful for us to understand how comprehensive and how worldwide and how encompassing Jesus' rule really is. A diadem is a valuable stone, and it represents the power and the authority that is possessed by the one who wears it. A king typically wears a crown with a single diadem. That diadem validates the king's rule over a particular region. 
a particular land area. But we notice that Jesus' throne has many diadems. This indicates that Jesus has removed every king from his position of rule, and Jesus has taken that position of rule for himself. Each diadem in his crown points to a king who has yielded and submitted and given up his authority because Jesus has taken it from him. And John is writing back in chapter 11. He's relating the sounding of the seventh trumpet, and he writes this in chapter 11, verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. The world had its kings, and each king had its own territory. Collectively, the territory of all of these kings was called the kingdom of the world, and now that kingdom of the world belongs to Jesus. But notice the time frame also of this. This is really important for us to understand. The time frame is that Jesus will reign forever and ever. We know from our study in Daniel that kings have a time frame, a limited time frame, in which they rule and reign. Some, when they're doing really well, it's 40 or 50 years. But the time frame of Jesus' reign is forever and ever. And all the diadems belong to Jesus, and he will never give them up. No former king has any more authority going forward. None will be able to mount a challenge to Jesus because the authority and the dominion over everything belongs to Jesus. And that's encouraging. His reign will never come to an end. He will never be succeeded by anybody else, and that's encouraging to us. Then John writes something about Jesus. He says that Jesus has an unknowable name. He has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. We might ask ourselves, well, why did John add that? What is that there for? It's really helpful to understand why that's there. When we see something like this, what we need to do is we need to fall back on our literal and our grammatical reading of Scripture. God tells us two things right here. He tells us that Jesus has a name written on himself. So we know that. And he also tells us that nobody knows that name except Jesus himself. He's got a name on himself, and we don't know what it is. And we don't really need to surmise what this means. We know what this means. What this means is that there are things about Jesus that we don't know at this time. And one of them is the name that he has written on himself. And the believer will spend eternity in the presence of Jesus. And this is really exciting, really encouraging to think about. And when they do, what they will observe, and they will have greater clarity on year after year, season after season, age after age, is just how righteous, just how holy, just how loving, just how kind Jesus was. The believer will get blown away age after age, time after time, epoch after epoch, when Jesus reveals yet another aspect of his character. That is part of what will just thrill us forever in eternity. In that time frame, we may come to know what that name is, and we may not. We don't know. Scripture doesn't say. But for now, it's not for us to know. But what we do know is that this tells us that Jesus is more impressive than we can even understand. There are things about him that we don't know, that we can't comprehend, and perhaps one day we will. And that is encouraging. We don't really even know the scope of our Messiah. We don't even know the size or the quantity or the capability of our Messiah. We don't know everything about him, but we know that it is all going to be good. Then in verse 13, John moves to Jesus' battle experience. This is really, really encouraging for us to think about. We read that Jesus is clothed with a robe, and that that robe is dipped in blood. Normally when we think of Jesus and we think about blood, we think about his own blood, blood that he shed on the cross, and we need to do that regularly. We do that every Sunday here. It's good for us to do that consistently throughout the week. Jesus shed his blood for us. That is really good. But what we read here is something else. We need to remember that this is the context of the lion, not the context of the lamb. And we need to see that Jesus' robe is already dipped in blood, but the battle has not yet begun. This tells us something that's really important for us to get. That is that on several occasions in the Old Testament, the pre-incarnate Christ was contending for God's people Israel. He was contending for them. And we've discussed many of these before right here in this pulpit. 
pre-incarnate Christ defended and protected Israel from Egypt. Exodus 14, verse 9, the angel of God who had been going before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. That was the pre-incarnate Christ. He was also there fighting for Israel during the conquest of the promised land. Joshua is evaluating the land that's in front of him. He's evaluating Jericho. He's speaking to a man, and the man says, No, rather, I indeed come now as captain of the host of the Lord. Isaiah 63 writes the words of the pre-incarnate Christ himself. These are the words of the pre-incarnate Christ as he comes and carries out the Father's wrath against Edom. He writes, I have trodden down the wine trough alone, and from the peoples there was no man with me. I trod them in my anger, and I trampled them in my wrath, and their lifeblood is sprinkled on my garments. I stained all my raiment, for the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption has come. John's audience gets a very clear picture. And what they get a picture of is that Jesus is a battle-tested warrior who has never lost in any engagement that he has entered. The evidence of his defeated foes is right there on his garments. It's right there. And he will win again here at Armageddon. How encouraging is that? Jesus is heading into battle and coming with him in battle. What he brings with him is his own resume his own history, his own testimony that he has been victorious again and again and again. And then John tells us that about Jesus' transcendent nature, his transcendent nature. John tells us that Jesus' name is called the Word of God. And this takes us back to the words that John wrote in his gospel, in chapter 1 of his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. We know that the word here refers to Jesus himself. This passage tells us that Jesus was in the beginning. The point of emphasis here is on Jesus' existence. He was in the beginning. It's good for us to remember that Jesus pre-existed the world that he is coming to conquer. Just think about that and the importance and the significance of that for a minute. He pre-existed the world that he's conquering. The scope of his existence extends far beyond the boundaries of time and space and color and temperature and pressure and sound and smell, far beyond all of those. And that's really significant for us to consider here because the Armageddon context is a context that is contained within the boundaries of time. But Jesus, because he does exist, outside of the context of all of these things. And therefore, he is not constrained by these things. But the army of the Antichrist, the Antichrist, the false prophet, they do not exist outside the context of these things, and therefore they are constrained by them. And because of that, they pose no threat whatsoever to Jesus, who sits outside of all of these things. Something that is constrained poses no threat to the thing that is not constrained. So this, again, underscores the point that the battle-tested Messiah will once again be victorious. And that's encouraging. And then in verse 14, John describes the following that Jesus has that comes after him. The armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. John tells us that it's not just Jesus who comes forth at his second coming. There's an army that's following after him, and those are the saints that are coming forth behind him. Those who are with him are those who have been raptured away from this earth prior to the great tribulation. These saints have been raised from this earth, and their souls have been reunited with their resurrection bodies. How do we know that these are the saints? Well, it's really helpful for us to look at the preceding verses, and they tell us that. Just look back to verse number 7. John describes a group of people who are following Jesus here in this context, and they're wearing white linen, fine linen, white and clean. If we look back at verse 7, we see the bride of Christ is wearing the same clothing. Revelation 19, verses 7 and 8. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride, that's the body of Christ, has made herself ready. 
It was given to her, it was given to the bride, to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. John's describing the same group of people here in verse 7 that he's describing later on in the chapter. The army which is in heaven is this very same entity. It's the very same group of people, his bride, who has made herself ready. It's good for us to think that the saints are following Jesus into the battle of Armageddon and that they're wearing bright, clean garments. And the brightness and the cleanness and the whiteness of these garments that they're wearing assure us of something. That assures us that those people have a purity. They have a sinlessness that is part of them at their resurrection. But notice that they're wearing this linen into battle. Again, this is the greatest military engagement which is going to take place in all of human history. And what are they wearing? They're wearing linen. Why aren't they wearing something more substantial into war? Why aren't they wearing war garments? That's because they have no need for them. They have no need for them because precisely of the fact of this, and that is that in their resurrected condition, their physical condition will be so robust and so impervious that they have no need for that protective equipment. None whatsoever. Their only garment is white linen. That's what Jesus does for his army, for his people. When they're resurrected, they have a new body, and that body is impervious to death, even at the Battle of Armageddon. And if you are a follower of Christ today, you will be in that group of people wearing fine white linen, following after Jesus, heading down to Armageddon, wearing white linen, totally impervious to death. That is encouraging. Then John gets to verse 15, and he talks about his power. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations. Do you notice that Jesus is the only one with a weapon here? The saints have accompanied Jesus because they will rule alongside of him in his millennial reign. But their task is not to fight this battle. That task belongs to Jesus and Jesus alone. And he alone will fight the battle, and the reason why he is the only one who will fight it is this. That when it's all over and the enemy is defeated, everybody will know that the victory is due to Jesus and nobody else. His weapon is the sword that emits from his mouth. And in the same way that words are spoken very quickly, the effect that those words will have on those that are arrayed against Jesus will also be very quick, equally quick and sudden. And this again is very encouraging to us. The forces that are marshaled, the forces that are amassed against the holy city, that are against Jerusalem, they're gathered together in the plain out there. This is the greatest, again, force in human history, and they are going to be defeated, and they're going to be defeated in an instant. And they're going to be defeated with words that come from Jesus' mouth. Then Jesus goes on to describe that Jesus' second coming will put on display Jesus' unchanging rule, he will rule them with a rod of iron. A rod of iron is something that is unbending. It doesn't bend. It never changes. So Jesus' rule will never change. Not only will the rule itself never change, but the nature of his rule will not change either. You have one ruler, and you have one ruler whose rule does not change in its nature, and that rule is good. The standard of righteousness by which Jesus will rule at the beginning of his millennial reign will be the same standard of righteousness that he's using at the end of his millennial reign. Many kings have come to power through unjust means, and they've used that same unjustness to wield the power that God has entrusted to them. But by contrast, everything that Jesus will do to establish his rule and everything that he will do to exercise his rule will be right and good. Listen to what the Old Testament prophet Zechariah says about the reign of Jesus. In Zechariah 8.3, he writes this, Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the city of truth. Jerusalem will be called the city of truth. The point from which Jesus will rule will be known for its truth. How encouraging is that as we consider the world that we live in today? Truth is misrepresented, it's maligned, it's distorted, it's rejected. Jesus' rule 
will be unbending and unending. It will never be tyrannical. It will never be despotic. It will always be overflowing with truth, and everybody will know it. So that's encouraging. Then John describes Jesus' coming vengeance. He said that Jesus press, treads the winepress of his spirit wrath of God the Almighty. And this does not refer to the ultimate end of those who have gathered against Jesus. It's not return, referring to the lake of fire. Rather, it's referring to the wrath that the Father pours out against those who are arrayed and who participate in this battle. The important thing for us to see in this is that as we look at the first part of the verse, we see Jesus with his power and his sword. This comes out and this describes uh, the effect, this describes the victory. But what we see at the end of the verse is that Jesus is actually an agent of God's wrath. It's really helpful for us here to consider the lion and the lamb. When Jesus came to earth in his first earthly ministry, he came as the lamb and he came to absorb God's wrath in place of everybody who would trust him as their Savior and Lord. But here in his second coming, he's not coming to absorb the Father's wrath. He is coming to execute the Father's wrath, and he's going to execute it on those who have gathered against his people. And lastly, we see that Jesus' second coming will put on display his preeminent rule. He has a robe, and on his thigh he has written a name, and that name is King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. This just helps us understand that Jesus sits above any other form of authority. He's king of kings. Authority has been bestowed upon other kings, but that authority is only temporary. The authority to rule over this earth has always belonged to Jesus. It's been conferred onto kings temporarily, but it actually belongs to Jesus. It's really good for us to see what Jesus says about this. He's speaking to Pilate in John 19. And he says to Pilate, you would have no authority unto me, over me, unless it had been given you from above. Any authority that a king has is granted to him by God, but the ultimate authority belongs to Jesus. And to whatever degree those kings rule over those under them, Jesus is going to rule over those kings in exactly the same way. He's Lord of Lords. This is saying the same thing, but on a smaller scale. There are many who rule over countries, but there are others who rule over smaller scales and smaller dominions. This would include rulers of estates. We think in medieval times of barons or feudal lords. Men today who have some sort of regional responsibility. Lords that exist over commerce and trade or enterprise of some kind. All of these have some kind of authority over citizens, residents, employees. And some of them wield substantial power. Some of these people are very, very, very wealthy people. But Jesus is their Lord. These lords will be subordinate to Jesus in the same way that their subjects are subordinate to them today. These things all put different aspects of Jesus on display at his second coming. And that's what we need to remember. That's what we need to take great comfort in. Quickly, we're going to look at a couple of different things that relate to Jesus' victory. Uh, the next two verses talk about how Jesus' victory is announced. And what's really encouraging about this is the announcement comes and the announcement declares a victory. Let me read these verses again. John writes, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in mid-heaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and those who sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves and small and great. This is the announcement. And the announcement kind of has four pieces, and the first is the herald. The herald is the angel. Angels are God's messengers. And they usually come and they're declaring something that is to come. And we'll notice that this angel is crying out with a loud voice. Standing in the sun, he's got a loud voice. God is indicating that this message needs to be heard and understood broadly. God wants there to be a comprehensive understanding that his judgment is coming. And it's coming through Jesus, the Messiah. The audience is the birds which fly in mid-heaven. These are the predatory birds, the scavenging birds that we know today. These are real birds, and they survive by eating flesh. 
often the flesh of other dead corpses of some kind. And there will be plenty of those here for them. Then the announcement describes the great supper of God. The announcement is actually about the supper of God. It's not about the battle itself. It's about the thing that is the result of the battle, the human carnage that's going to come about. That's how certain we can be of the final result and outcome. The great feast is about to be produced. The defeat will be so devastating that all of the birds of the air will have their fill. There will be such an abundance of dead carnage that all birds will have their fill. And finally, there's the defeated. And the angel describes comprehensively five groups of people, kind of in descending order of authority or influence. He has kings. These are the kings who have aligned themselves under the Antichrist. He speaks of commanders, those who are sort of the brain trust in the military engagements. He speaks of mighty men, leading men in war who, who arrange things, horses and those who ride on them. And then he gets to the common soldier, men, both free and slaves. Many, many men will be constricted into service here. Slaves will be fighting here. But God's point in describing all of these things and all of these groups of people is that all of them will be destroyed. There will be none that get away. All of them will be killed and their flesh will be scattered across the battlefield. And all the people of the earth need to know this. So again, the victory is so certain that it is declared before it is accomplished. And then John describes how the victory is actually accomplished. And first, he describes the assembly. And this is really great. He describes the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies are all assembled to make war. Their intent and their purpose and their goal and their aim and all of this is to use every bit of their means, every bit of their resources, every bit of their abundance to make war against the Messiah. And it's all done under the ultimate leadership of the Antichrist. So their plan is to destroy the Messiah, to make war against him. So they're poised and they're ready to make war. And John goes on and he goes to describe the conflict. But there is no conflict that John describes. John doesn't describe the war. There's no conflict. What the false leadership of this world had hoped for, what had they prepared for, what they had amassed all of their resources together for, it simply didn't happen. There's no record here that is given of a struggle. There's no record here that's given of an engagement. There's no strategy. There's no records of gains and losses. Jesus didn't even give them a chance to compete in this battle. John describes the outcome in verses 20 and 21. What takes place is the two leaders of the world system are just removed from the battle. They've gathered together. They've amassed themselves together. All of their powers of deception and deceit are at work. And they're just removed. We see at the beginning of verse 20, the beast was seized and with him the false prophet. When something is seized, it is bound. It is made powerless. Its influence is taken away. And that is what happens to the beast, the Antichrist. The two most influential people in the world are simply removed from their positions of influence. That's how Jesus does this. The kings, the military leaders, the mighty men, the great men, the small men, the slaves, the free men, all of them have just lost their leadership. And it's gone. And God has a destination for the Antichrist, and he has a destination for the false prophet. They don't go to Hades. They will never experience the great white throne judgment. Instead, they were thrown into the great lake of fire. God simply removes them from the theater of war, and he sends them to their permanent end. Their permanent end. There's a finality to their place where they go. There is no other place for them. And God is saying, your authority, your influence, your defeat, your rule, everything about you has come to a final end. Then John moves on and he describes everybody else. And we see that in verse 21. The rest were killed with the sword which comes from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. The description is concise. John doesn't go into a lot of detail about how that takes place. He doesn't see the need to provide those details here because what he wants his people to understand is that there is one simple outcome. 
and that is that the Messiah is victorious. And he's victorious in permanent ways. If you want to read more details about how that happens, I would point you to Zechariah 14. Really great passage in Zechariah that describes what happens there. The army is amassed at Armageddon. They are, they are aligned against Christ, the Messiah who has come. And what happens is that army, the, their flesh begins to rot. There's eyes rot out of their sockets. There is confusion among them. They begin to engage in battle against one another. So with all of their resources and all of their riches and all of their wealth and all the weapons that money can buy, they end up using them on one another. All of this tells us that, that Jesus' victory is comprehensive, it is sudden, it is permanent, and it will never be undone. And that's encouraging to us. So our takeaway tonight is that Jesus has proven to us in this passage that he is worthy of our trust and our obedience today. If we can trust Jesus to bring this age to a close in that kind of a context, that kind of a military context, and we can trust him to inaugurate in the next age his millennial reign, then we can trust him with whatever we're dealing with today. And some of the things that we're dealing with today are very substantial. But what God has given to us here is evidence that we can trust him today because he will be faithful, he will be true, he will be victorious. We live in a day where there is an increasingly godless governmental influence in our lives. Many of us have sobering health issues. I know that to be true in my own small group here at this church. Inflation is surging forward and our finances seem to be going backwards at this time. And that's a concern. And there are other concerns, many, many, many more. But we take comfort that, that Christ is the Messiah. He is coming to rule. He is coming to reign. And he will make all things right. Let's pray. Father, we praise you and we thank you that you gave to us your son. Lord, you gave to us your son who could do something we could never do in his first coming. He went to a cross and he satisfied your wrath against us. Lord, for the hundreds of thousands of sins we have committed against you in our lives, the millions of sins we have committed against you in our lives, your son was capable of absorbing your wrath against each and every one of those. And he is indeed the propitiation for our sin. We praise you that you gave us a son who has already done what we could not do for ourselves. That he purchased our salvation for us and that you applied that to us through the work of your Holy Spirit on the day of conversion that you had identified for each of us. But Lord, your son is again coming in a day in his second coming and he will do another thing that we could never do. Lord, we could never bring this broken world to an end we could never set up a rule that is right and true and just. And your son is going to do that, and he is going to do that decisively, comprehensively. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for that. I pray for my friends here tonight. I pray that all of us would be encouraged. Lord, with the things that you have for us this week, we walk out of here, we go home. Lord, that we would know that a day is coming where all things will be made right. We will know that that same Messiah is here today in our hearts. You have given him to us. He has residence in our hearts. He loves us. He is our Lord and he is our master. He is our shepherd today. Lord, I pray that we would be comforted by this. I pray that we would be encouraged by this. And I pray it in Christ's name.